Hello, everyone, everywhere. Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to the Kingdom Crossroads podcast today. We're so blessed that you're joining us. How many of us have done something knowing we should not have done it? Sometimes it goes unnoticed. Sometimes it's not only noticed, but it has tragic results. And in some of those cases, grief begins to set in, serious grief, self-blame, shutting ourselves off from family and friends, maybe in some cases, even hating God for allowing whatever it was to happen. Well, the scenario I just laid out for you, as familiar as it may sound to some, is from a fictional book titled Awakened by Grace, written by my guest today, Darlene West. Darlene is a retired corporate developer, program designer, and curriculum specialist. Though she grew up in and loved the restaurant business, she says her favorite regular job was being a Christian radio disc jockey in Champlain, New York. Praise God. She was a, has a bachelor's degree in English with a minor in the concentration of fiction, as well as a master's degree in adult education. And she's put it all together with those skills in the writing of this great book, Awakened by Grace. Help me welcome to the program, Darlene West. Darlene, thank you for joining us on the program today. And thank you for having me. Amen. Now, the first question I always start with, other than that brief information I just shared, tell us in your own words, who is Darlene West? Darlene West is a mom. She's a wife, a mother, and a granny. And I'm also known as the fudge lady here in where I live. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I Amen. Do, yes. I'm, I've been using my mother's recipe for fudge for years. And people, I sell it at fairs and festivals and stuff in, in my area. Amen. And people, yeah, they go, you're the fudge lady. Well, I'd rather have them know me as the author, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I am, uh, they call me Granny's Goodies, the Fudge Lady or Granny's Goodies. Amen. Well, uh, you know, there is a charge for being on the podcast, and it's a pound of fudge. You know that, right? Oh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, so tell me, what inspired you to write Awakened by Grace? Well, I used to go out and street evangelize. Mm -hmm. And when I was out, and, and also too, I used to go to mental hospitals and bring the message of Jesus Christ. And I learned and noticed that a lot of people had a lot of self-condemnation in them and a lot of guilt for things that they have done. And some the people in the mental institutions were emotionally grieved by their own lives, what they, how they, you know, I didn't accomplish nothing or things that they had done to other people. And I thought, you know, this is really sad, you know, because everywhere I went, I met somebody who thought they weren't good enough for God. Mm. And so I thought, you know, um, I need to reach out more people as a street evangelist or when I'm evangelizing, sometimes I just start evangelizing when I'm at the grocery store. Yeah. I, I noticed that I'm doing one-on-one -on -one and then God started laying in my heart the name Franklin Franklin. And I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And um, he says, you can reach a lot more people for me uh, that's hurting if you write a novel. And so I said, well, Lord, you're going to have to give me the words. Well, it took me three years to write it. Amen. And um, I wanted to get it right with God. And we had a lot of conversations about it, but I, I sat down and I start writing. Amen. Now, the subject of the story for everyone listening is Franklin Franklin. That last name for our listeners is spelled with a Y to differentiate it from the standard first name. Which, you know, darling, what's funny is I had a good friend in the army. His name was Mitchell Mitchell. Right. <laughs> And, and when I saw how you named your main character, that's the first thing I thought of was my old friend, Mitchell Mitchell. <laughs> 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 anyway, tell us about your main character, Franklin Franklin. Uh, starting out, he's not a believer, right? Oh, no, no. Him and his wife had gotten married before they got saved. And um, before she got saved, should I say. Now, he's a professor at a private university which is fictitious university, of course. And he believes that he's quite the intellect and he's got far more intelligence and he's far above any foolish Christian. And his whole family had gotten saved and his whole family around him are, you know, are Christians. And, um, but he, his wife is, 
was the love of his life. And so he humored his wife and um, about her faith. And he was kind of proud of her being, you know, she chose what she wanted to choose like that. But um, he had no use for Christianity whatsoever. But his wife and his family was this whole life. I mean, he identified himself with his wife and his family. That's everything to him, even though he was a professor, an English professor, too. Hmm. Okay. And is his character based on someone you know, or just rather designed for the purpose of this book? Rather designed for the purpose of this book. Okay. All right. Then, yeah. Then tell us what happened to the wife. Well, the wife has a tragic ass accident and she gets killed. Mm -hmm. And of course, Franklin blames himself for this accident. And he, well, he um, gets so grieved that it's a chronic grief. And he, con he condemns himself so badly that he pushes his family away. He pushes all social interactions away from him. And, he, you know, for two years, he's living in like in a cocoon, losing his mind, which is making it worse for him. Yeah. Amen. Without anybody around him. Yeah. So he, he's becoming a recluse, basically. Right. Yes, he was a self-imposed recluse. Yeah, man. And then, how does his granddaughter Maggie break through this grief and teach her grandfather a thing or two about faith? Well, before the accident, Grand, uh, Maggie was his princess. Him and Maggie had a very close relationship. So, what happens is, is that you know her parents, his daughter and her husband moved down to Oklahoma to go to school to become missionaries. And they bring Maggie to him. And Maggie, she loves her, her, her grampy, but she doesn't understand at first what she's going through. But Maggie's a mature girl, little girl at her eight. Oh, uh, I would say a little bit more mature than most little girls at eight. I mean, you see her childish ways in her at times, but most of the time she's got so much faith that she's very mature. Amen. And with her faith prayers are answered before his eyes. And she prays and she's so confident that someday he is going to get saved, no matter what day it was, but someday. And she comes to visit him for five days while her parents go on a, uh, on a trip to Arizona so they can see about becoming missionaries. Um, they, were going, they want to have like a job interview. Mm -hmm. So she's with them and it's Christmas time. It's not a Christmas extravaganza, but it is Christmas time. And she gets him to do things that he would not have done before because the relationship gets, becomes rekindled as they are together. And how does, all this play into him coming around to the Christian point of view. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> it takes a lot for him because he's really stubborn. His biggest <laughs> problem. <laughs> Grandpas are like that. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, she, she'll pray for the favor of God for a parking space and the parking space is there. Hey. And he starts wondering what's, you know, what is going on with her? Um, why is all this stuff happening to him when she's around him? At first he gets spooked. And then after a while, he figures, well, hey, this helps out. So I'll just take it for my advantage. But she introduces him to new people. Mm -hmm. And she also introduces him to a pastor. And she leads him and guides him through divine appointments throughout his you know the time that she's there for five days and oh, yeah. so he, that's where you start seeing very slightly but you start seeing the the changes in franklin just a little bit at a time and so but the one thing even you know with faith he still doesn't know how to move on without his wife katie yeah yeah amen amen so did all of this happen just in that five days? Is the whole book written in that five-day period? The whole book is written in that five-day period. 
Amen. Amen. Well, actually, no, uh, I'm sorry. It starts out before the accident. Yeah, yeah. And then it comes two up years. two yeah. years later. The two, the second year anniversary was what that wife's death. And he's basically losing his mind by then. Mm. Amen. Amen. So a short synopsis of the end. Uh, he comes around to Maggie's point of view, right? Yes. Childlike faith. Amen. Childlike faith. And that's what reason why I made her so mature is because she's actually showing people, because Jesus said that we need childlike faith. And she shows the childlike faith that God wants us all to have. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And you said it took you three years to write this book? Yes. Now, yes. I haven't written any type of uh, fiction book myself, so I'm just asking this kind of out of curiosity. How hard is it to develop like the characters in, in this book since this was all fiction? I mean, how did you come up with the storyline and, and all of the interactions and the plot development? Prayer. <laughs> <A lot of it. laughs> Even when I was in, at the university and had to write, you know, fictitious stories, I had to pray. Um, actually, I'll tell you a story. When I was a little girl, very young, starting from like three, four years old, I used to make up all kinds of stories. I used to love to tell stories. And so one day, when I was about seven years old, my mother asked me, so Darlene, what do you want to be when you grow up? Before I can answer her, my elder sister said, she's going to be the biggest liar that ever lived. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, my stories were, I guess it just comes to me naturally because when I was like the first time in, I think it was sixth grade, my, from then on, my teachers were using my stories as an example on how a wow. story should be written. Yeah, wow. so I believe it's a gift from God. Yeah. And, and yeah, so, absolutely. you know, we all got our gifts and what God wants us to do. And when God told me to write, you know, Franklin, Franklin, I didn't even know what to title it. And then all of a sudden it came in my heart. God showed me to title it Awakened by Grace because mm -hmm. basically that's what happened. He got awakened by grace. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and golly, when you're writing a book like this, do you, you know, like you see in the movies where you shut yourself away for days on end or, or how does that work? <laughs> no, I'm in my own office in the house and, um, or sometimes I would sit out in the living room, put my computer on my lap and um, I'd be typing. And like one time my husband came out and I'm crying. I mean, because it was a sad scene for me that I was writing and my husband didn't know he wanted to know what happened to me what was wrong and I said I'm writing you know but I block everybody else out you know I may tell my husband I'll be about 15 more minutes and because uh, he was looking for dinner and next thing I knew I had done three hours <laughs> so and you yeah. walk in the kitchen and the pizza sitting on the table right yes <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> he, um, when I write, it's I step into my character, my my, you know, I step into all the characters, and I become them as I'm writing. And like I said, I believe that's just something that God gifted me because this is what He wanted me to do. Besides evangelist, and I evangelize now. I can see it through my novel that I can reach, I was reaching one-on-one, -on -one. now I can reach thousands of people. Yeah, amen, amen. Were there ever periods of time when you like hit the wall, you know, writer's block? Yeah, but never lasted too long. It only lasted, I would pray when I got uh, writer's block. And the, the thing is, is that when I pray, all of a sudden, about five minutes later, I'd be typing and the story just start pouring out of me. I never got, I, I believe because of the Holy Spirit, I was never stuck that long. And, you know, I get stuck on a word and I ask God to show me the word that you want me to put there. 
And then after he shows me, I would investigate the word and make sure, yeah, okay, God, you're right. <laughs> you know? mm. But um, yeah, that's what happened to me when, with writer's block. I would just pray my way through it. And it never lasted, like I said, more than five minutes, maybe 10 minutes the most. Hey, Amen. Wow, that's great. That is, that is great. So when, when you're writing this book, you know the plot at the beginning and you know the plot at the end, you know what's going to happen at the end, but did you write the beginning and the end and then fill in the middle or did you just write it in sequence or did you kind of get to the middle part and it's like, okay, now how am I going to bridge this? How, how did all that work out? Well, I write it from the beginning to the end, but first I write from the beginning to the end in my mind. And then when I sat down to write, um, I, I wrote it from, you know, in, in sequence, but then, you know, like I would write something, I'd write a chapter, and then my husband and I would be reading the chapter together, and all of a sudden, God would tell me what else I need to put in that chapter, hmm. and then I would go back at it, and I would rewrite that chapter, and I did that several times, and it kept growing. The first chapter kept growing. It went from two pages all the way to what? What is it about? 15 pages now for the first yeah. chapter. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So yeah. my wife says, that's how I talk. So that's how you talk. Where <laughs> <laughs> you go. So what genre does your book fit into Christian fiction, Christian fiction? How, how do you classify it? It's literary fiction. I like to write, see literary fiction is uh, character driven. And the genres, you know, are the topic is driven. Mm. So I, you know, when his wife died, he's a young man for, you know, becoming a widow, widower, should I say. You know, I think he's like 47, 48 years old in the novel. I didn't actually give him an age, but I mm. put him in about that age group. I could have wrote a, a woman to, you know, help him through his life, you know, let him fall in love again. But that would have been a romance and everybody would have, you know, looked on the woman that came into his life. Yeah. I want I want people to see Christ in there and know that it's Christ that pulls you out of the dark spaces, that he never fails you or forsakes you, that he's always calling you and walking with you. And the darkest of times, Jesus is there. And he's always working on something. And his, in the darkness, his light shines even more powerful. Amen. So that's where I wanted people to see that it was Christ. It wasn't another woman or it wasn't another person. Maggie is not the one that's going to actually, that actually does, you know, she, she leads him, but she doesn't complete it. It's Christ Amen. that completes it. Amen. Amen. So where does it end? How does it end? Does he go full-time ministry and open his own church? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you want me to tell the end on the air? Well, no, you don't have to, because then people won't want to buy the book, because they'll know how it ends. <laughs> yeah, it's on the, wall, the, middle, the beginning, the middle, the end. Amen, amen. Let's, let's talk about Maggie. How does it end for Maggie? Does she, you know, say bye, Papa, and get in the, the car and with her parents and travel to the missions field, or how's that work? Well, that's part of the exciting end. I don't oh, think okay. I'll Never mind. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to get all the good parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, how hard was it for you to find a publisher for your book? And who is the publisher, by the way? Well, my publisher actually is Whiff and Stock and Resource Publications is the imprint they put my novel under. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, as a first time author of a novel, which I say, it's very difficult to get find somebody to publish you. It's yeah. difficult to get an agent, it's difficult. They want people who are already known yep. or have you know written and, and they got a, something behind them. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. 
And then one day God showed me Whiff and Stock and I thought, okay, I'm gonna submit it to them. And a few weeks later, I got an email, we've accepted your, your novel Amen. for publication. And that was my miracle. But it's very hard, but I have to say, don't give up. <clears throat> if you're writing your first novel, don't give up. Mm -hmm. And just God has, he didn't tell you to write that so that you could just have, you know, a job to do. He told you to write that because he wants it read. Amen. Amen. And to don't ever give up because God has a place for you. Glory. <laughs> so are you working on part two? Is this going to become a series for this story with Franklin Franklin or Maggie? Well, I thought about that. And... I'd like to write literary fiction because I like to write subjects. And um, <clears throat> I think I probably will do a sequel and, you know, with Maggie and, and you know, Grampy. But Maggie, you know, as Maggie grows up, I might do a series. Hmm. But I also, in my next novel, though, I'm seriously thinking about writing about how <clears throat> a family is affected by one family member that gets ad addicted to drugs mm. and how Christ can help them with that. And I've been praying about that, but people have been asking me to do a sequel that have read it already. So I kind of torn, so I have to see which way God's gonna lead me. It would be a good series because I think that I got, the way I ended it, I ended it for a sequel. Yeah, it sounds like it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So I read that uh, you're trying to help out in the, not just the drug abuse area, but also human trafficking. Uh, it's yes. not helping out in human trafficking, but helping to combat human trafficking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that clear. That was a clarification point because that just came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really abuse, uh, battered wives and battered girlfriends or even battered men, but I know more about women than I do men. So since I am a woman, um, I, I have helped them for years. And um, I really, my heart is really hurting for these little girls that are being kidnapped and used yeah. for such a horrific thing yeah. um i heard one story how this one girl she was 12 years old and she was tied to the bed and she had to entertain 50 men mm. that day oh my goodness i know 12 years old and that was just i so heartbreaking it's so very heartbreaking and, and I just, I've been praying about it and God has been opening up doors for me so that I can help out. Yeah. Amen. So, I know human so, trafficking, is, it's a serious pandemic. I mean, more so in my opinion than COVID-19. And oh, I've, yeah. over these last few years, I've interviewed several people that, that have ministries devoted to rescuing you know, traffic women and children from this type of abuse. And yes, drug abuse is a very real part of that culture. I mean, the perpetrators use drug abuse to control the victims. Yeah. And then the victims themselves, even if they end up being rescued, often revert back to drugs just to try and numb the pain and, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I mean, yeah, it's a very serious thing. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Amen. Yeah, it's a terrible thing that happens to families and these children uh, it's just driving me crazy to even think of you know even my own town i live in a very rural town here in northern idaho and um where everybody knows each other and everybody helps each other out mm -hmm. because you know we are so rural yeah. and right in our town we have the problem of human trafficking Oh, wow. And that really upset at me, you know, yeah. when I heard about that. Amen. Amen. So uh, when you're writing your next work, when do you think you're going to get that one published? I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to start writing in about two weeks because I have 
other u interviews as well mm -hmm. yeah. I'm working on for this novel. But um, when it first came out, of course, it came out last year, March 2nd, it was mm -hmm. released Amen. and COVID hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yeah, the interviews is helping me a lot right now. Yes, for, this, it's got to get out there to the people to help people. Amen. Well, when you do write your next work, please reach out because I'd love to have you come back on the program. Oh, I would enjoy that a whole lot. I really would. Amen. And Awaken by Grace right now, it's available on Amazon. Is that how everyone can order a copy of the book? They can order on Amazon or through Whiff and Stock, my publisher. And um, yeah, that's, those are the two ways right now. But on Amazon, there's other stores that have the novel as well. Okay. Oh, right. Barnes and uh, not Barnes and Nobles. Barnes. Um, one Barnes is it Barnes and Nobles? Yeah, that's a bookstore. Yeah. Yeah, it's Gary. Is it Barnes and Noble? I believe so. Yeah, you can go there and get it. All right, all right, Darlene. I yeah, have one more question for you. And I read, and, and we opened with that one of your favorite regular jobs is working as a disc jockey at a Christian radio oh, station in Champlain, yeah. New York. Is that right? Yes, WCAP okay. Champlain. <laughs> All right. Well, two, I actually have two questions for you. Sure. First, what was it you enjoyed the most about that job? When somebody called me up and thanked me for the song that I played, one time our um, satellite dish was aimed towards, we were right on the Quebec border. And in Quebec at the time, I don't know if it's still the same thing, at the time, they weren't allowed to have Christian radio except for um, mm -hmm. a priest, a Catholic, somebody who was Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so somebody from Quebec City, like somebody from Quebec City called me up, and that was a couple hundred miles from me, and thanked me for the song. It, it just helped them at that moment. That's what they needed. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most rewarding parts of it is when people would call me up like that and tell me thank you. Amen. And yeah. Amen. Well, when you concluded your shift and we're signing off the air for, for your shift, I know every disc jockey had their own unique sign off. I have mine that you'll hear in a moment. Praise God. I want you to give us your sign off as we conclude this interview. Can you do that for us? Thank you for tuning in to WCHP Champlain. You have a wonderful evening. I love you. And remember that Jesus is your lord amen amen i love that i bet you weren't expecting that question on an interview were you? No, I wasn't. <laughs> amen. Well, darling this has been a fascinating interview if someone has a question or wants to get in touch with you maybe do an interview like this how can they do that how can they get in touch with you um they can con uh, they can email me on my uh email which is d w for darling west author at yahoo.com dw author at yahoo.com right oh. i'm not on I, I was on facebook i'm not on there right now i was <clears throat> i was tagged yeah. because I, I put up one of my um representatives letters and mm -hmm. um i got warned <laughs> so I'm off of there right now. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but they amen. can get me through my email. Amen. Folks, if you want a good read that's going to hold your attention outside all the drama you see in the news and happen around the world right now, you need to get a copy of this book. I'm telling you, it will suck you right into the story. I mean, you'll be angry for a while at old Franklin, 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 and I'm telling you the truth, but he comes around, praise God. The love of his granddaughter finally <laughs> breaks that shell. Amen. But you need to get your own copy of this great book by Darlene West, Awakened by Grace. In fact, I'd re recommend that you get two or three copies. If you're part of a book club, recommend the book to your group. I mean, I think all of you would, would really get into the story and there'd be so much you could talk about. Amen. But even if you're not part of a book club, I know that you know 
someone who would enjoy this book. So order two or three copies, one for you, a couple to sew into someone else's life and do it right now while you're thinking about it. Just go down to the show notes, click the links, they're right there, amen. And you'll be a blessing to yourself and someone else as well. Darling, thank you so much for coming on the program today. I do appreciate all you shared with us. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Amen. Folks, that is all the time we have for today. For Darlene West and myself, this is Pastor Bob. And Darlene, here's my sign off that I told you about. This is Pastor Bob reminding you, be blessed in all that you do. <laughs> I love that. <laughs>